Good, act good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people here on what is actually a very nice uh, May evening. Um, uh, welcome to this event entitled, Can Markets Pursue Social Values? Uh, this event is being recorded for, for a podcast, and so for those of you who will be listening subsequently, um, we're coming to you from quite an auspicious location, the Shaw Library. Um, we're actually sitting in the light of the, the Fabian window, the famous Fabian window, which says uh, you should pray devoutly and hammer stoutly. Um, and I think the Fabians would be quite interested in this topic, which is it, it's a broad and ambitious uh, question we are addressing today, certainly one I don't think our panelists can answer exhaustively, but we have a quite extraordinary panel of experts here who are going to give us their views on this difficult, thought-provoking question. Um, to give you some context uh, for the event, it's taking, uh, taking place under the umbrella of the Beverage 2.0 Festival, uh, which has been taking place uh, for the last few months here at the LSE. Um, and the Beverage 2.0 celebrates the 75th anniversary of the very famous Beverage Report, um, uh, written by um, a director of the LSE, uh, which identified the five giants of kind of public policy concern at the time, um, prefigured the uh, introduction, the development of the welfare state in the United Kingdom. Um, the Beverage Festival has been uh, reimagining, re uh, revisiting the beverages five giants for the uh, 21st century. So, looking at these have been reimagined as poverty, healthcare, education, housing, and work. Um, the, uh, I suppose, in the in sort of where where precisely this um, event came from was that in the process of uh, planning the Beverage Festival, it came at the same time as the Prime Minister, Theresa May, gave a very provocative speech to celebrate the uh, 20th um, anniversary of the independence of the Bank of England, where she gives what is a rousing defense of the values of the free market economy. Where she describes the free market economy as, quote, the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. Uh, not really much nuance there. Um, and so the purpose of this panel is really to think about um, beverage and beveragean ideas of collective social progress in the context of, I suppose, 2018. And the big difference between beverage 1.0 and beverage 2.0 has, of course, been uh, the rise of what, for want of a, a better term, I think it's a term that's uh, overused and occasionally abused, but the neoliberal thinking. And I suppose the, the, the criticism of, um, uh, of, of government failure and the preeminence of, of market-focused thinking. So really, this panel is trying to open and ask the question, to what extent can markets and market-based public policies for the sorts of collective social concerns first identified in the original beverage report and still of pivotal importance today? Um, I'm going to introduce um, our very uh, distinguished uh, panel. So I will introduce them um, in the order in which they will speak. Uh, first, we have uh, Professor Simon Deacon, um, Professor at the University of Cambridge and Director of the Centre for Business Research. He is um, an expert in innumerable areas of legal research and he's also very much an interdisciplinary scholar um, uh, working in the area of, for example, um, economic analysis of law, corporate law, uh, labor law, EU law. Um, we then have uh, Professor uh, Julia Black. She is a professor of law here at the um, Department of Law of the LSE, and she's also pro-director for research here at the LSE, and she is really one of the preeminent scholars in the world of, of, of the field of regulation, particularly um, the area of financial regulation. And we third will have um, Dr. Sean Ennis, who is a senior economist um, at the uh, competition division of the OECD in Paris. He has also had a very distinguished career in um, competition enforcement in several uh, governmental agencies. Uh, and I guess I would perhaps, uh, particularly he, he is an expert in, in uh, innumerable areas of competition policy, but perhaps of, of greatest interest for this particular panel. He spearheaded um, the OECD's uh, recent, very, I suppose, groundbreaking work on the link between competition policy and inequality, and to what extent, the extent to which markets can actually be used to solve problems with inequality. Uh, 
So um, I'm, each of the panelists is going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will open uh, to the floor for questions. So, fine. Well, thank you very much, uh, Neve. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to say something, first of all, about Beveridge and his, I his ideas, um, and then to relate uh, Beveridge's legacy to debates today about labor markets and how social security um, is organized. Before Beveridge wrote the, the famous report on social insurance in 1942, he already had a very long career of being uh, an activist, a reformer, uh, and a researcher, and an academic. Back in the 1900s, in 1909, he'd written a book called Unemployment, A Problem of Industry. And the title of the book says everything about the approach he and the other Fabians took to the analysis of the labor market. Unemployment, according to Beveridge, and the Webbs and other Fabians was not the fault of individuals. It wasn't the fault of individual malfeasance. It wasn't the fault of shirking by work shy people. It was a feature of industry, of the way in which capitalism was organized. And above all, it was a feature of the way employers operated. Employers hired uh, people in a way that created underemployment, created irregular and casual work. And what in those days was called casual or irregular work Today we call labor market flexibility, and we laud it as an important feature of the way our society works. The downside, of course, with casualization, to give it its proper name, is that it denies workers a regular income, but often gives employers uh, a cheap pool of labor from which to draw. It wasn't just employers, either. It was also the state at that time, in the early 20th century. The state itself perpetuated the conditions for a casual labor market through what was then known as the poor law, the, uh, the predecessor of social security law. Um, in many ways, the poor law um, has been misinterpreted. Um, as long ago as the um, 17th century in this country, there was a poor law. And to be poor and to be in poverty didn't mean lacking resources. It specifically meant um, being wage dependent, being wage labor, not having independent means and working for your living at a point when most people sort of had access to the extended family or to the land. To be poor was to be dependent on an employer or on the state. But the laws regulating the so-called poor in this country from a very early stage of its industrial development actively supported the emergence of a labor market. There wouldn't have been a labor market and there wouldn't have been an industrial revolution in this country had it not been for the poor law, which provided so-called outdoor relief cash payments to the unemployed and to the elderly and to the sick, organized at parish level in the thousands of parishes which operated after the end of the Tudor period, but under legislation that was national. And that national legislation required local parishes to raise a poor relief through taxation of property at local level and forbade charitable giving because it was deemed to be inefficient. It was more efficient at the state organized social security. Now that idea, those ideas faded away in the 19th century to be replaced by the workhouse. And Beveridge and the Webbs were coming to this debate at the end of a period in the 19th century when it gradually became obvious to nearly everybody that the workhouse system wasn't curing unemployment. It wasn't counting unemployment, but it didn't cure unemployment and it didn't cure poverty. Because poverty in London and other major cities in the early, early 20th century 